part one of the, of the series, uh, How to Overcome Temptation. So uh, we got to go ahead and start. Let us pray. <laughs> and Father, Lord, we need you every hour. And we recognize and realize the only way we can to make it to overcome is through you, is in you and you living in us. And today we ask you to teach us. We ask you to expose the uh, the ways of Satan's temptations, the way he tries to, to hook us, to get us to yield, to rebel against you and your word. We pray, Lord, as we go through this class, this teaching today, that you would make it very clear to us so we can see the plans of Satan. Give us clear understanding of your word. May we not only be convicted of your word, but may we stay true to your word and be converted. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, notice may be saying uh, this is an interesting, I know for me, topic, the science of temptation. You know, temptation, there is a science behind it, believe it or not. How to overcome it. So let's go ahead and look into that right now. What is temptation? Now, temptation is a solicitation or enticement to sin. And by breaking God's commandments or rejecting his testimony, rejecting his truth. So Satan, all he wants to do is to entice you to rebel against God, to seduce you from following the will of God to no longer following the will of God. It's solicitation. Now, again, temptation is not sin, but yielding to it or actually doing what's, what was being presented before us is sin. Now, we all tempt it. So let's go ahead, since we know we're all tempted, let's look at the science of temptation. So what is the science of temptation? And what it is is a skillful implementation, don't miss this now, of intellectual and practic practical methods based on systematic study. Don't you know this is actually a study? Same name playing. Satan has classes on this, and he actually has his demonic classes at the University of Satan teaching them how the science of temptation, why he's a professor, and he is the master of temptation. So he teaches his demons every day how to implement, how to implement skillful and intellectual and practical methods based on the sympathetic, sym symptomatic study of behavior of human beings to entice them to sin against God. So he looks. He cannot read the brain. He can't read your thoughts. But he can look in your eyes. He can look at your facial expressions. He can look at your behavior. He can see the things you like and the things you dislike. How much time you spend with this and how much time you spend with that. And he tells his demons, because Satan cannot be everywhere at one time. But his demons, there are many demons out there. And he tells them to go out. He tells him exactly, look at his eyes, look at him, see what he's doing in the dark, see what he's doing behind closed doors. This is how we're going to do it. It's systematic study. That's part of the syllabus, the science of temptation. Now, who, of course, is the architect of temptation? Let's go ahead and look at this. We know who it is, the number of Satan himself, Lucifer. But let's go ahead and look at this as we uh, lay the foundation of this science, the architect of the science of temptation. Isaiah 14 12 through 14. And we men read this many times. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Thou art cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations. Lucifer, meaning the one that the uh, sun bear, the one that bear the, the light, light bear. Verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, 
I will ascend. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of congregation in the sides of the north. Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So we see here Lucifer, the architect of temptation, caught up in pride. Now, he's a created being and he says he wants to be divine. Is that possible? There is impossible that any created being can be divine because divine divinity is eternal. Divinity has always existed. In other words, there was a time that Lucifer did not exist and now God creates and now he exists. But now he's saying, I want to be like God. That position that Jesus has, I want that. But Jesus is God. Lucifer can never be God. But he was jealous for the position and he deceived the mind. What does that say about pride? Pride makes you stupid, right? It does. Because pride allows you to think irrational thoughts. And Satan knows, and that's why that's part of the science of temptation, if he can get us caught up in pride, he already got us. Because now your thoughts are irrational. They're not thinking right. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't go into reality. The pride. And pride, of course, he wants to lead us to what? Doubt. And this is a key thing right here. It's the science of temptation. That's his number one goal. See, if I can get him to doubt, I can get him to reject truth. And I get him to reject truth. They're going to say some stupid stuff like, you know, there's two rocks that collide and now you have life. <laughs> I mean, that's rejection of truth because they deny the reality of truth. Pride. He was caught up into that pride. The Satan is, a, is that snake that we'll learn more about. And today what we're going to do is we're going to practically learn how to go, how to overcome Satan's delusive, seducive enticements to sin. We're going to learn how we can actually have total victory over sin, but we need to understand the science of temptation so we can avoid the pitfalls that Satan has for us. So y'all ready for this? this? Is This is serious stuff right here. We're living in a time where Satan, where God says, you know, in the last days, many shall be deceived. They're going to be deceived because they're listening to the temptations that Satan has and they're being enticed. I'm talking about all people. And he's going to put it out there to all people. Even if it's possible, the very elect will be deceived. Now, remember, Satan can't make you sin. You know, people say that Satan made me do it. No, we choose to sin. And we have to understand that. Only thing that Satan can do is tempt us to sin. He can put his enticements out there, try to mesmerize us, hypnotize us, but he can't make you sin. We choose to sin. We choose to walk down that way. When God says, no, don't go that way, and we continue to walk, walk, guess what? That temptation gets stronger and stronger, and then as we continue to sin as a result of the temptation, then that sin gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And again, remember, Satan can't read your mind, but he's studying you very carefully, all of us. The demons are studying you very carefully. I can tell you this, though. If you are believing the law of God and the testimonies and are doing it, Satan knows you personally. He knows you personally. He, 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 don't, pay, he don't really try to know every single 8 billion people on this earth personally. But there are certain things. His Bible did say his, he, had his, his, he is wroth with who? Who is he wroth with? It says he is wroth. Now, the demons, of course, they're wroth, too. But it made it very clear that Satan is wroth with those who keep the commandments of God, those who follow the testimonies of Jesus Christ. That's what, So he knows you personally, and he has come. He said, no, there's certain things that I got to do. Now, when Satan, did he, when Jesus went into the garden of, the, I mean, the uh, wilderness of temptation, did he say, well, you know, um, over there, Jack, why don't you go ahead and, and try to tempt Christ? He didn't call Jack the demon. He said, man, you, I can tell him, Jack said, I got it. I can do it, man. I know I got him. The man says, sit down, man. This is, this is what I, I got to do this. And Satan is out there personally tempting God's people in these last days to walk away from truth. And, that, and I'm, just, I'm just saying, I'm putting this out there because I need to know this. Satan is an architect of the science of temptation. 
As we mentioned, Satan can't make you sin, but we are no match. Understand, the closer I get to Christ, then the temptations get weaker. We can't handle this being right here. He wants to make himself seem elusive, that he's not real. Satan is real. That's the reason why God revealed it in his word so we can be aware how real it is. We're no match for this being. Matter of fact, the Bible says in Hebrews 2, 6 and 7, it says, but when the certain place testifies, say, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Verse 7, thou madest him what? A little lower than the angel. So we are, do not have the power or the capability of angels. We were never made that way from the very beginning. The angels are a higher order of being. And Satan, Lucifer, is an angel. But we'll find out he's not just an angel. He was one of the most powerful angels in heaven. And we, as a, especially, and that's in our perfect state, sinless state. Adam and Eve were made a little lower than angels. So now we, in our sinful state, there's no way you can handle Satan. There's no way you can outwit him. It's just totally impossible. He was speaking to you back and forth. You would actually, if you continue to dialogue with him, you would do everything that he says do. Nothing. We can't handle him. We got we to gotta suck up our pride and say, I can't handle that, dog. I can't handle, I can't handle him. I can't handle it. Because remember, he's the wisest being ever. He was the wisest angel. He was created with the highest position. Remember, he was a what? Covering chair. He sat next to the throne of God himself. He was powerful. How does the Bible describe the fall of Lucifer? Describe Lucifer before his fall, rather. How does he describe this, this powerful being so we can understand who you're dealing with here? Ezekiel 28. Let's go to there real quick. I have it on the screen. Ezekiel 28, 12. Ezekiel 28, 12. And we go up to 14. Son of man. Take up the lamentation of the king of Tyrus and say unto them, focusing here on Lucifer. Thou saith the Lord, thou, thou what? Sealeth up the sun. Talking about Luc Lucifer. Thou sealeth up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. God made Lucifer perfect, beautiful, full of wisdom. And, and I remember a few years ago, I said, Lord, why do you say sealeth up the sum? And the Lord said, just think about a cup. Think about a cup. Think about a cup. When you, a cup, when you fill it up to the rim, what happens after that? It spills over. It's overflowing. That's what I put into Lucifer. In other words, silt of sum, it, it, it equals the greatest value or measurement. There was not made another greater angel that can measure up to Lucifer. Lucifer, God poured into Lucifer that no other angel actually experienced or had. He didn't lack nothing. He was extremely beautiful. The most wisest angel, the most beautiful angel in heaven. The Bible says in verse 13, Thou hast been in garden of God, every precious stone, thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the braille, the axon, the oinix, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the gold, and the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. He was beautiful. He was like a walking jewelry, jewelry store, so to speak. <laughs> All these precious jewels that no other angel had. Some angel, one angel probably had a diamond. And another angel may have had a sapphire. Some angels probably didn't have all these things, but, but Lucifer had it all. He was blinged out. You know, the, in the Greek word tabris is tamarines. Lucifer was made with a rhythm. You know that? But this rhythm that Lucifer was made was in unison with the rhythm of God, just like our heartbeat. Our heartbeat is in rhythm with the with the rhythm of God. And we talked about this before, the rhythm of God, that one, three beat. 
One, two, three, four. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're mar. That's a that's a one three beat. Your mind is on on God. So when Lucifer walked heaven, that's the way his beat was ro- was rolling. Um, we're marching. There's Lucifer. Wow. The focus was on who? God, not himself. He was marching to Zion. He was, he was walking to the rhythm of God, not to the rhythm of rebellion. See, when he fell, he changed it. He remember, he's a masterful, masterful musician, and he changed it to the Hypnotic beat, known as the syncopated beat, the syncopation beat, that hypnotic beat. He said, okay, now we're going to, I know all about music and I know how to make people move. To take the focus off of God and place a focus on man. He changed the beat, it delayed the beat one beat. You know, if you know music is usually counted in fours, one, two, three, four. With the emphasis is on, the, the rhythm of God is the emphasis on one and Two, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That's the emphasis on, on the rhythm of God, but the rhythm of rebellion is one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And it's that dance beat. I'm not going to get too much into that right now, but he was made with that, and he know how to manipulate that, but he was made with pipes, so he's a squire by himself. He probably sounded like an orchestra and sang like a choir. He was the most intelligent, the most musical being, the most beautiful being. And then the Bible says, thou art the anointed cherub. He had an anointed position. The, the cherub that covered, the one that set to the, the, he was one of the two angels on the right and one was on the left. He stood next to the throne of God. This is Lucifer, the one that failed. He was perfect. Verse 15, thou was perfect in, in thy ways from the day that thou was created until what? Iniquity was found in thee. And we see that when iniquity was found in Lucifer, when he was cast out of heaven, his music became corrupt into rebellion. His, his wisdom became corrupt into evil intelligence. You don't understand something about evil intelligence. Satan can remember everything you've done since birth. Everything. Can you believe that? He doesn't forget. He doesn't forget. He, he sees and he saw, he sees how you looked at something before and he remembered. He let the other demons know and they know. But he can process all these things. There's no supercomputer that can actually match the brain of Satan. He's a master scientist. He's a master chemist. He knows how to manipulate things to make things work to try to control the brain. It's called pharmakia. His beauty became corrupt and deceptive. He's used his beauty for deception. So over 6,000 years, you have a being. How old are you? (laughs) 6,000 years of experience. 6,000 years of perfecting the science of temptation. 6,000 years. Do you think you can handle that? There's no way you can handle that. You have to be near to God. What happened as a result of Lucifer's pride and rebellion? We know the Bible says he was what? Cast out of heaven. He was kicked out. God pleaded and he 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 pleaded pleaded with him. Let's go to Revelation 12, 3 and 4. Let's look at that real quick. We already know he was kicked out of heaven for rebelling against God. And his demons was cast out with him. But how many were cast out and we we know we know this we know this but we want to see it from what the bible says because we want to see how he was able how he was how he got other angels in heaven to join in the rebellion we're going to look at how he did it based on the scripture revelation 12 3 through 4 and it says and there appeared another wonder in heaven behold a great dragon and that of course is satan himself as we're representing here, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew what? The third part of the stars of heaven and discast cast them to the earth. And a dragon stood before the woman was ready to deliver for the devour her child 
as soon as it was born. But the main thing we're focusing on here is that tail from the dragon. It drew one third of the stars of heaven. Now, stars, of course, represent the angels. We studied this before, so I'm not going to go too deep with it. Revelation 120 reveals that the stars are the angels of heaven. And this, so these stars are representative of angels. And this, this, this dragon with the tail represents Satan. And it says he used his tail to do what? To draw one third, a third part of the stars of heaven. He did what? He drew them. That's what temptation is. Temptation is a what? Drawing, an enticing, a seducing. Come to my side because what I have over here is better than what you already got. And, and, and his main goal is to do what? Rebel against God, right? So we see here the stars of heaven are angels of heaven. And Revelation 12, 4 reveals that Satan was able to get 130 angels in heaven to openly join him his rebellion against God. How did he draw them with the tail? How did he do it? You got it. What does the tail represent, everybody? Isaiah 9, 15. The ancient and honorable, he is the head. I said it right. The ancient and honorable, he is the what? The head. And the prophet that teaches what? Lies. He is the there it is, everybody. The one that teaches lies is a tale. That's why God says, I want my church, I want my people to be the head, those who are given truth, and not the what? Tell. Anytime we're given falsehood, we are the what? Tell. Anytime we reject the truth, we are the tell, teaching lies. The Bible says they are deceived and being deceived. So those who are deceived go out, continue to spread the lies. The other tale. And that's exactly how Satan drew. He tempted the angels of 130 angels with lies, period. They believed the what? Lie. Isn't that amazing? They had the joy of heaven. They had something that's already great. And Satan says, hey, I can make it better. How can you make it better? He said, hey, I got a better plan, man. I need to follow my way. But they already had what Satan was trying to give. They already had it. They already had freedom. They already had happiness. They already had joy. They already had beauty. <laughs> so, Abe, so Satan was able to persuade 130 angels to join him in his rebellion with his life. But that does tell you something. God still, there's two-thirds that didn't believe. There's two-thirds that say, I ain't believing that foolishness. Two-thirds, so God has twice as many angels as Satan does. So if you need the power, just call on God. He has, so Satan's defeated. Now the name Lucifer after his fall reveals his character. Satan, that's why his name changed from Lucifer, and even though today he may be walking around saying, I'm Lucifer still, he's not Lucifer. He's Satan. He's the adversary. The Greek means adversary. Diablos, the devil. That reveals his character. He's a false accuser, a slanderer. That's what he did in heaven. He, exactly, he's diabolical. He placed accusations against God. He swung to slander his name. Now, does his mission, has it changed? No, it's still the same. Is he still an adversary? Yes. Is he still a false accuser? Yes. Or a slanderer? Yes. Satan named his name. Satan, and the devil, reveals his character after his open rebellion. And we can see that everything that God is, Satan opposed. Everything. You ever see somebody like that? Just, I say go right, they go left. Satan openly rebelled. He opposed the commandments of God. He opposed the truth of God. He slandered his character. He openly, falsely represented the character of God before everybody. He put God on blast. He put him on blast. In order to entice the angels in heaven, the devil misrepresented the character of God. He used, a, he used a mixture of truth and lies. But one thing he used to his great advantage, guess what he used the most to his great advantage to, to have them actually listen to him? What he used the most that people try to do a lot today so they will listen to you. So, so you can seem like, seem like you're the authority of this subject or that subject. What do we use? Our credibility. Well, like I'm a PhD and I'm this and I'm that. That's why you should listen to me. And Lucifer said this the same thing. That's where it came from. Lucifer said, I am the covering cherub. 
I sit next to the throne of God. I have an exalted position. That's why you need to listen to me. Yes. I mean, I have the inside scoop. I'm in the place that you all are in. So you need to listen to me. And he used that to his advantage because many angels looked up to Lucifer, who had an exalted position. And he still does the same thing today. The cry to create doubt about the truth of the character of God. The cry to make doubt in the minds of his hearers by using the credibility. Do people do the same thing today? We should listen to me because I'm the pastor. I'm the president of a conference. I have an exalted position. You're not there at those meetings. I know the inside scoop. I know what's going on. <laughs> See, false accusations were presented to all of creation. Remember, everything that, say, that God is, Satan said that God is not. God's true character, God is love. Satan, false accusation, God is not love. God's true care. God gives all his creation freedom of choice. Satan says, no, he doesn't. God is a God of force. Satan, God is, God's true character reveals that God is kind. Satan is saying, no, he's not. He's a tyrant. God's law is freedom. Satan says God is bondage. And this accusation goes beyond, goes to all of creation. Everybody. Full-blown rebellion. What does God to do? God's character is on trial now. For the first time, his character is on trial. This has never happened before. His character is on trial and he's being questioned. Is it true? Is it true? You see angels starting to depart, trying to get getting further and further away from God and going to congregate with Lucifer. But the question is, why didn't God just go ahead and just get rid of him? Get rid of him and the one third of angels that rejoiced in his rebellion immediately. Now, one thing I understand, God's character is on what? Trial. There's been an accusation. Just imagine if you were stealing a thousand dollars from somebody's bank account. You've been accused and they brought you before the court. An accusation has gone out to everybody in the community. And you, have, or you are innocent. You have proof that you're innocent. Everything that you have not taken the money. But John Brown comes in there and says, she has taken my money. I know it. She's a thief. And you get up in the courtroom. You pull out a weapon. I ain't no thief. Boom, 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 boom. Person go dead. Boom. Now, what would everybody think? <laughs> everybody goes, exactly. They're going to say, man, that man's not only a thief, he's a murderer. See, God's name, his character was on trial. Nobody understood the results of sin. Creation has never experienced anything like this. They don't know what death is. They don't know what pain and misery is. They, uh, they never experienced this before. So to say, oh, see, I killed him because you'll be ex you would experience death. You would experience misery. You would experience chaos. I just want you to avoid all that. What will people think now that God is destroyed? Wait a minute, God. What do you? Maybe, maybe there is some credence to what Satan was, what Lucifer was saying. Maybe, 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 man. I'm kind of scared. Oh, I don't, I don't, uh, maybe we, we are forced. So what, what did God have to do for his name to be vindicated? He had to let the, he had to let sin run his course. Remember his name is on trial. He had allowed people to see for themselves death. The results of it. But but, 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 everybody will have to choose. You, did you get it? Did you miss it? They didn't have to experience it. Because God is saying, hey, 
you can serve me freely. Now the accusation goes out, he's made earth already. Satan and demons are cast down. Earth is made. And I can see Satan saying, hey, man, come on now. Hey. God says, I have it. I'm going to show that, that nobody is forced to serve me. They do it out of, out of the freedom of their choice because, because of who I am, the character I am. So what does he place in the middle of the garden? To test man's loyalty. Genesis 2.8, and the Lord planted in a garden eastern and east eastward in Eden and there he put man that whom he had formed and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge and good and evil so we see there's two trees in the midst of the garden in the in the central part of the garden the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life and we see as we learn that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a what? Test of loyalty. See, every time they went to the tree of life, they were choosing who? God. But once they went to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were choosing the evil one. So it was a test. They had a choice, a freedom, and God put it there as a freedom. Remember, his name is on trial. His character is on trial. So everybody has a choice. Yeah, they didn't have to experience death or pain. They would just have to trust God that, Lord, you're right. I don't want to go that way. Even though you never experienced it, you said you would surely die. I, I get you, Lord. I, I'm not going to go that way. So after God made Adam and Eve on the sixth day of creation, it said that everything was what? Good, very good. That his creation was perfect. It was good. They were made in the image of God to reflect the glory of God. And one thing I'd understand is they were perfect. They didn't have our sin, sinful tendencies, but they still had a choice. They still had a choice to eat from the guard, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or not to eat from it. So Adam and Eve were made in perfect harmony with God. But as a test of loyalty, what was God's explicit instructions about the tree of knowledge and good and evil? So now let's look at this. I know we read it a thousand times in your life, but we're going to we now we're about to explore a little bit. We're going to explore this. We're going to break this down so we can understand the science of temptation. Let's see what God told them. All right. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded man, saying of every tree. Of the garden, thou must freely eat. Now he has new creation. He's telling them he's excited. They're excited. And I can imagine he's saying that with a smile. From every tree, you all, of the garden that you see. Look at all these beautiful trees. Taste this. Taste this pineapple. Mm, this is good. Every tree you can freely eat. You may freely eat. And they were excited about that. Then he said in verse 17, but. And I can imagine he said this as a stern parent. He said, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now look at all these trees, y'all. <laughs> look, all, look, around, look around you. Wow, Lord, wow. But you see this one in the middle? Don't eat it. Uh, eat of a tree of life, but this one, don't eat of it. You, you, you know, now you need to understand this. God said what? Surely die. Words are very important when it comes to Satan and his temptations. Words are extremely important because the words that are used to entice. He can't make you, but he wants to entice you with what? Words. Surely die. The Hebrew word is muth. Die, muth in the Hebrew, is actually repeated twice. When you look at the, 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 the reference for surely die, they repeat the word twice. Die, die, meaning muth, muth. So the great emphasis is on what? Die. So in the Hebrew, it would, it would sound more like this. In the day that I'll eat thereof, thou shalt muth, muth, meaning die, die. So in our English language, to really interpret that, man, this is shown enough death, this God ain't not, God is not splicing words. He is letting them know 
you're going to die, die. You, you got to understand what I'm saying? You're going to cease to exist. So in the English word, the King James Version got it right. You're going to surely die. That's what it is. You moose, moose. You're going to die, die. Exactly, the second death. You'll never live again. You'll never live again. You'll cease to exist. Now, we know that Adam and Eve failed the test of loyalty. We know that. But before that, we already know that God actually revealed, just like he does in his word today, he revealed to them what happened in heaven. Didn't he reveal that to us? He revealed it to them. He revealed to the, the fall in heaven. He revealed to them, he tells you, you need to watch out for that, that Lucifer. Now, remember, he only had access to the tree. That's it. But we know that he, they failed the test. So let's go ahead and so now, let's go ahead and take time and study Adam and Eve's fall, fall, how they fell, and learn more about the science of temptation so we'll avoid being enticed. Now remember again, the science of temptation is a skillful implementation of intellectual and practical methods based on what? Systematic study of behavior of human beings to entice them to sin against God. So again, God exposed to them clearly the science of temptation. It wasn't like he didn't let them know, just like he's letting us know. He revealed to them exactly what Satan and how he was able to deceive 130 angels. So just like we have no excuse, they had no excuse either. You think God's going to keep in the dark about some major like that? No, just like he told us, he said, there was war in heaven. He tells us, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. He tells us that Satan is wroth against those who have the commandments of God and the testimonies, Jesus. So we have no excuse. So the question we're going to be looking at in a little bit is, how does Satan tempt Adam and Eve to sin? Don't look at that. What are the same techniques that Satan is using today, and what are the lessons we can learn to resist Satan's temptation? I hope you're ready for this. Satan, we already know, just like Ms. Sean mentioned today, he was like a pit bull chained to the tree. He was confined to the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And you can imagine his only avenue was to, to get Adam and Eve was where? The tree. So he had to study the pair from afar. Every day. Even when they went to the tree of knowledge, the tree of life, you can imagine Satan is looking at him. Go there, go back. He sees him all happy and giddy. Oh. He sees him walking with God in the cool of the day. He sees him laughing. <laughs> the joys. <laughs> God, this is so awesome. He sees that. He sees Eve with Adam. He's like, mm, if I could just get them apart, if they took, oh, he sees them together all the time. He's like, oh, they're always together, always together. Day after day, he waited and waited. We know not long. We don't know how long he waited, but he was patient. He began to scheme and talk to his demons. I can imagine they had, 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 had conferences together. We only have access to this tree. How can we do it? And they're thinking, they're scheming, they're thinking. How can we draw them? Lucifer, you have a musical. You, 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 oh, I don't know. I, I, they're not hearing me. I'm, I'm seeing, probably, I don't know. Oh, they got close to the tree of life. Oh, had a bird in a tree. I was like, mm, I can't get them. And get him. But one day, Lucifer noticed something <laughs> with great delight. He said, wait a minute. Where's Adam? I just see Eve here. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. Shh. Be quiet, demons. Be quiet. That's Eve. Man, she's beautiful. Oh, oh, she's getting a little closer here. So as he sees Eve in her curiosity, just wandering around, noticing she's by herself, he sees that. He says, okay, hold up, hold up, don't, don't, shh, 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 shh. Then he gets the most subtle creature, the most beautiful creature. Believe it or not, it's, uh, <laughs> it was actually the most beautiful creature at the time. I know it's hard to imagine it today. <laughs> 
He took the most beautiful, subtle creature, of course, the serpent. And he sees Eve just sitting there. And then he noticed her just looking, getting closer to the tree and getting curious. He said, this is it. <laughs> this is it. He said, I got it now. And again, Satan began to use his, for the first time, he put together a puppet entertainment act. And he began to talk to her. That was a beautiful snake at one time. He began to talk. In Genesis 3.1, we're going to see this serpent. For the first time, you're going to see an animal speaking. But we know the voice behind it is nothing but Satan himself waiting for this moment. And he says, it's here. And he's telling all his demons, please don't mess me up. I got to concentrate. This is our only chance, everyone. Remember, I have promised you all a kingdom. And this is it. This is our chance. She's here. She's. <sighs> so now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Genesis 3.1 which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, have God said that ye should not eat of every tree of the garden? Now you can imagine when Satan said it, he said it with a seductive voice. He said it with, with, with music in his, in his voice. He said it where Eve was just, mm, wait a minute, what's that beautiful sound? That's just so nice. Eve was seduced by the music of the voice. And I can imagine he probably said, hey, how you doing? Yeah. You're beautiful. And he began to talk to her. And while Eve is getting closer and closer to the tree with her curiosity, Satan asks her a question that directly challenges God's truth. And this is what we need to understand, everybody, in the science of temptation. He will always challenge God's truth directly. But he can do it through a question. Don't miss it, everybody. Now, God's truth is explicitly clear. God said clearly, the Lord commanded man saying of every tree of the garden, thou may have what? Freely eat, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that I eateth, thou shalt surely die. Are every, is every single word in that truth important? Is every single word in that truth important? It's, you better believe it. You better believe it because if you don't understand the truth of God's word and every single explicit words that God gives us to us, we're in dangerous territory because we're going to see it in a little bit. See, in verse 17, God uses, why does God use the word but? He uses it for a reason. It's a conjunction to clearly reveal an exception. Say so you can eat from every tree freely, eat from every tree, except but this one tree. Is an exception to what previously said. So in other words, you, can only, you can't eat just from one tree. You can eat from every tree, but not just one. But I want you to see this here. See what Satan does. See, notice in verse, in Genesis 3, 1, Satan also uses a conjunction. I don't want you to miss this now. He uses a conjunction word, and it's known as yay. Now, in our, in our modern English, you don't use the word yay, but it is a conjunction, yay. In modern English, it can be mean as but or an indeed or also. So he actually, he actually uses a conjunction against God's conjunction. Yay or but or indeed also. Have you thought about this? So Satan uses yay to refute God's truth. Don't miss it. He uses yay or but. To, his, to refute God's truth, but he mixes it with truth. Now, how in the world can he do this? I'm going to show you something. He actually refuting God's truth, but at the same time, mixing it with truth. It's just kind of like our Bible story earlier. If you have bread with dong in it, it's still no good. There it is, everybody. We're going to learn these two words here. It's covert negative and incredulous. Convert negative and incredulous. Let's, let's look at this question. Let's look at it, and then we're going to learn more about convert negative and incredulous. Yea, or but, have God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Let me ask you a question. Is that true? Is that true? It actually is true, because they couldn't eat from every tree of the garden. 
<laughs> Don't miss this now. It's true. They can't eat from it. When you just look at it bare bones, they can't eat from every tree of the garden. But Satan did this in a way to trap Eve, and he does the same thing to us today. That's why you need to catch this. It is true. But he uses technique here. Lesson number one, you need to understand. The technique that you, Satan used in the phrase of his question to Eve is known as a covert negative. Covert meaning a hidden negative. But it's twisted truth. It has a stealthy purpose that on the surface a person would not see. Only way they would see if they know the explicit truth. Don't miss it. Only way they'll see is they know what? The explicit truth and have faith in the explicit truth. But if they don't know the explicit truth, they will be deceived. Satan took what God said and emphasized the exception of not eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But ignores a positive statement that they are freely to eat freely from every tree. Did you see catch that? Because he, he, he God said you can't eat from every They couldn't just eat from every tree. Because God said, you can freely eat, but this one. But Satan just mixed it together and said, hey, did, can you, does God say you can eat from every tree? Ooh, now you got to think about that, don't you? Hmm. That's why Eve responded. You'll see in a little bit. So notice what he's doing here. So he's, he's, the spirit of prophecy calls it a covert negative to twist the truth. Lesson number two. Remember, what is Satan's main goal in the first phase of temptation? To do what? Create doubt in God's truth. So one of the main techniques that Satan uses to tempt us like he does eat, did Eve, is present his temptations in an incredulous way. Now, y'all need to understand. Do you understand the word incredulous? Let's look at this because he does this very. So it's not just him saying it. It's how he said it too. Incredulous means disinclined or indisposed to believe, in other words, skeptical. So the way he asked the question, it wasn't just, did God say it? He said, did God say that you can't eat from, et, from every tree of the garden? It's just like this, and Sean shared this with me before. Now, what if I told you, um, you don't eat meat? I said it like that. You don't eat meat. You're looking at it like, that's positive, right? I'm saying it in a positive way, and you interpret it. You're going to interpret it like, yeah, he's with me. He, he understands. I don't eat meat. He don't eat meat. He obviously don't eat meat, too. You don't eat meat. You know, that's good. I'm saying it in a, in a, in a positive way. You don't eat meat. It's a good thing. And if you interpret it, yes, I don't eat meat. Anybody else eat, eat meat? No, I don't eat meat. Praise the Lord. But what if I turned it around and said it in an incredulous way? where there's skepticism. You don't eat meat. Now, <laughs> now, how do you interpret it? Like, man, something must be wrong with me. You don't believe that I should eat meat. You think I'm stupid for eating meat. You don't eat meat. <laughs> and I remember Sean was sharing that. He was at a Bible study, somebody who'd never been there before, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they start talking about health, and out of nowhere, Satan puts some suggestion in her mind, and she says, by the way, you don't eat meat, you must be in a cult. <laughs> Sound like a cult to me. But that's exactly, it's incredulous. The way, even the way that the, the, the question is asked is question to doubt truth. And that's what Satan, he, he put it in a way, you mean that God said you, can, you can't eat from every tree? You seem like you're just stupid. And God is just totally unfair. That's the way we interpret it. Remember, when we listen to people's words, we interpret at the same time. You're interpreting what they're saying. And even though they're speaking English, we still interpret to get a clear understanding of what's going on. So we're looking at body language, how they're saying it. And then we interpret it, okay, he's being, he's, he means it this way, he means it that way. So the tone of disbelief and skepticism is how, exactly how Satan presented his question to Eve. And he does the same thing today. And the way he phrases the question, the receiver interprets it, do you really believe that? I mean, come on. 
I remember a minister was speaking about against the Sabbath to his big congregation. I just, and then he said, he told everybody, do you really believe that? And how do you think people interpreted that? If I believe that I'm just stupid and I don't want to make sure I don't want, ooh, I don't want to believe that now. He said in a very skeptical way. Do you really believe that we keep Sunday because, and then he changed it, we keep Sunday because the resurrection of Jesus. But keeping the seventh day, we no longer are under that dispensation. Do you really believe that? <laughs> and everybody's like, no, <laughs> I don't believe it. You. Because remember, that pastor is using his credibility to say these things, like Satan. What is Satan's covert, negative, and credulous question also saying to Eve? Let's look at it. These are interpretations. Why, does, why doesn't God want you to eat, and this for you, to eat from the forbidden tree? Why doesn't God want you to eat from the forbidden tree? Putting, trying to put in interpretations, questions in her mind as he asks this one little question. Is he trying to hold something back from you? That's what, that's what I think he's doing. He's trying to hold something back from you. And then you find here, you find, don't miss it, a sympathizing friend. A sympathizing friend. See, Satan was trying to make it appear that he was a sympathizing friend because this seemed just totally ridiculous. You mean God won't let you eat? Look at all these trees. And he's saying you can't eat from every tree. Come on now. Poor baby, poor baby. Oh, let me help you with your problem. God is not being reasonable in his command, is he? Isn't he? Eve, come on. You can't eat from every tree. Oh, you got to be hungry. God's holding something back. Look at it. Mm, this is so good. You should taste some yourself. Sympathizing friend, be careful to sympathize with people who are doing wrong. Be careful because anytime I sympathize when people are doing wrong, to gag people, try to, that's what Satan tries to do. He uses people to try to, to sympathize them in their wrong. Person has done wrong and oh, oh, I feel, oh, you don't feel good, baby. How can I help you? Lesson number three, Satan or demons will come to you as sympathizing friends. An a, a angel of light. That's what he does. Comes to you first as an angel of light. That's the way he came to Christ, as an angel of light. Now, what should have Eve done when she saw and heard a snake speaking to her at the. F what? And she did that. Run, run, and run away and run real fast and get out of there. But we know she didn't do that. And the thing is, we at a fallen state, we don't do the same. We stick around too. We try to actually dialogue and anytime you dialogue with demonic spirits especially when god reveals it to you you're going to lose every time you're going to lose so when you know somebody's in sin they're trying to use incredulous ways to put doubt in your mind many times you got to do like christ but the bible says this and get out there's no time for dialogue and trying to actually converse with them and things like that you got to get out of there because satan is actually putting out there his temptations so she, yeah she should have ran Lesson number four, you can never overcome, never, what's that? Never overcome Satan's temptations by yourself. Never. Because what was Eve's main, what was her main, what was her main mistake? She left, she was by herself. See, her husband was like her security when they were walking together. But when she found herself alone, and she should have said, when she found herself alone, like, wait a minute, ooh, let me get, where, where, Adam, Adam, where you at? But instead of calling his name, she began to become curious about this tree. So this is your only security. Always you need divine help. Remember who you're fighting, who the villain is, who the adversary is. So we know our second major mistake is she placed herself in temptation's way. As Sean mentioned today, she made provision to be tempted. We're all going to be tempted. But don't bring it on yourself. Never purposely, lesson five, never purposely place yourself in a place of temptation when God explicitly tells you to stay away. 
when he explicitly says, don't go there, and I go anyway, don't expect divine power to all of a sudden take over. God says, don't do it, and then I'll go ahead anyway. Don't expect the Holy Divine power to to keep you from temptation, because the thing is, when I purposely put myself in it, I'm going to fall. And there's no spiritual divine strength in disobedience, none whatsoever. So how do we know that Eve was mesmerized and hooked by Satan's covert, negative, incredulous question? How do we know? How do we know? Because she asked, she actually responded back. <laughs> That's how we know. And just from that, Satan was like, yes, I think we got it. It's okay, okay, okay. Don't get too excited, everybody. Hold back, hold back. Don't get too excited. In trying to correct Satan, I want you to catch this now. In trying to correct Satan's incredulous question, she is saying, I think, uh, she is actually saying, okay, man, I don't think you're right. Hmm. I don't think you're right. Oh, I don't know. But at the same time, she began to doubt. Why? How do we know she began to doubt? Let's look at the question. Let's look at how she answered Satan. Verse 2, Genesis 3, 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the tree, trees of the garden. Now remember, Satan said, you can't, what did he say? You can't eat from every tree of the garden in a credulous way. And then her way is, her response is, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. I want you to notice this. But... The fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, you're seeing a response that now Satan has a sympathizing friend. <laughs> he has one at doubt. And remember, when you're in doubt, the next step is full-blown deception. So when you analyze Eve's response, you will see that she began to doubt God's truth. How do we know this? She, all, she misrepresented God's truth. Not only by misquoting it, <laughs> but she actually put more emphasis and focus on the forbidden tree. I want you to notice that. She actually puts more emphasis on what? The forbidden tree. She bought into Satan's covert, negative, incredulous question. Double, let's doubt analysis. Let's look at this doubt analysis that she has now. So in the first part of the sentence, she left out the word freely. And most people, you, you read over it, you miss it, you don't think about it. But remember again, every word of God is important to truth. She this reveals clearly how she's answering the question. She's answering it as if she's a victim now. He puts it out. You can't eat from every tree. She's interpreting. That's just unfair. Can't eat from every tree. But well, God didn't say exactly like that. But then he says, she says here, she left out freely. God said you can what? Freely eat. Why is that important? She said, we can eat from the tree. She didn't use the word freely. Why is this? Now, understand, God used the word freely for a reason. He put it there for a reason. He didn't just say, Adam and Eve, you can eat from every tree. He could have said that. He said, you can freely eat from every tree. And it's like, Satan, understand this. So you can understand everybody on that my name is on trial. Understand this. Everybody, listen. They can freely eat from every tree. But one. Why does God use the word freely? It's to reveal that God gave man true freedom to live and enjoy the goodness of God as a result to obedience of truth. Did you get it or miss it? It's revealed. They have freedom in obedience. They have freedom in, in, to enjoy the goodness of Garden of Eden, the goodness of the creation. They have the freedom to do thy will and they will be happy and joyous in obeying the truth of God. That's why I use the word freely. But she let it go. She left it out. Why? Because she's actually being drawn in to Satan's scheme. Now, in the second part of the response, so she t deletes the word. She omits a word from truth. And whenever you omit a word from truth, you're in trouble. 
In the second part of the response to Satan's question, Eve places more emphasis on the forbidden tree by adding to the word of God. Now she's not only the first part she took away. Now she's about to add to <laughs> look at it. Now, she also uses a conjunction, the same conjunction of God, but to give the exception, but it's a little different the way that God said it. Hers is not my victim, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. This fruit is so potent, even if we touch it, will die <laughs> see the human <laughs> when you start falling into satan's temptations your mind starts going all over the place so she add god did god say this neither shall you touch it god didn't say that not only did she add a word but she also deleted something too do you see what else she deleted she added that but she deleted something right there it's very important remember every word of god is important even interpreting his, her interpretation to the snake is this. The fruit of the forbidden tree is so deadly that even if I touch it, I would just die. God did not say that. First, lesson number six, whenever you omit, and we've seen this from Eve's, Eve's um, example. Whenever you omit any truth from God's word or add to it, that's a human reasoning in response to Satan's first phase of temptation, you are in what, everybody? Doubt. And now open for deception, you will fall anytime. That's why God said you got to be in his word every day. Anytime you start adding or deleting his word, when Satan is putting out the temptation, you're going to fall. And I can give example after example after example. You will fall. Verse 3. At the very end of the sentence, Eve also deleted a word. And you said, what, what was it, everybody? Surely. Is that important? See, we can't, every word, the freely was important. The surely is important. Because God said, you're going to die, die. You're going to surely die. But what did she say? On the day we eat of it, we'll die. Lest we die. Well, God said, surely, show enough dead, die, die. She deleted the word surely. And this is the reason why Satan actually came back with that word, came back with that word she deleted. Don't miss it. She, didn't he come back with that word that she deleted? He came back with it, and this is the reason why. See, God says surely die, meaning die, die, cease to exist. Even just, Eve just says lest ye die, meaning we're going to die. This exposes to Satan that Eve was in full-blown doubt. He says, I got her. She's in full-blown doubt of God's truth. I got her. Only thing I got to do next is she just had to reach out and eat. Put it in her hand. Put it in her hand. It's too late. You're touching it. Ooh, ain't, ain't nothing happening to you, Eve. Or is it? Is it anything? Are you dying yet? Touch it, Eve. Just touch here. I'm eating it. Just touch it. You're not even dead yet. You're just touching it and you didn't die. God must be lying to you. And really doesn't show. She really didn't believe that she will actually die. She really didn't believe that she will actually cease to exist. What does Satan say to Eve next after she deleted surely from die? What did he say? Three, four. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. He didn't just say you should not die. He said, you're not going to surely die. What do you mean by that? You're going to be able to exist. You continue on. You're not really going to die. In other words, God is lying to you. You are still having existence somewhere else. You have a, matter of fact, you actually have a higher state of existence than you have now. That's the same lie. Satan is telling you right now. In other words, you can kind of hear, you put in modern day language, girl, honey, child, you're right. <laughs> I agree with you. You will not surely die. Because remember, he has a sympathizing friend. They're friends now. She, 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 she sees herself as a victim, and all people who fall into skating temptation sees themselves as a victim of truth. So she sees herself as a victim, and they're friends now. So he can talk to her like that. Honey, child, you, I agree with you. You will not surely die. 
Remember, lesson number seven. What's lesson number seven? Satan's temptations always contradicts God's truth. Don't yield. Did I say always? Always contradicts God's truth. So Eve had Eve should have caught the snake's fly. She should have caught it right up, straight up. Now, the question is, why, did I, why didn't Eve catch the lie straight up? Why did, that's a straight out lie. Thou shalt not surely die. That's a straight contradiction. Why? This is it right here, and this is the reason why many people are deceived. All people are deceived who listened to the first phase of the lie and began to doubt. This is it right here. She's spellbound by what? Doubt. Now she's easily deceived. Deception comes in. And as a result, what happens to her discernment? Her discernment to detect lie was gone. Don't miss it. Anytime we begin to let go, have doubt, deception comes in, lies come in. You don't catch it. Why? Your discernment is gone. Your, the lie detector is gone. Well, you, you can, okay, oh, that's not the truth. It's gone. That's a straight out lie. Why would she catch that? That's a straight out lie. She just said, no, whoa, 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 whoa. That, that's a straight out lie because she was in deception. And the reason why that happens today, we, you wonder why. It's like, man, but God's word explicitly says this and that. This, the seventh day is the Sabbath. Why? Because they already doubt. Why? They're full-blown deception. And a discernment of it. They have no discernment. When the, when the Bible clearly is revealing that Satan is lying. Clearly it's right in black and white. He's lying. No discernment. So what's the lesson there? Lesson number eight. Whenever you doubt God's truth, all discernment or ability to detect Satan's lies is what, everybody? Gone. Don't miss it. In other words, you will be deceived. Anytime we doubt, if God, if Satan can get us to doubt God's truth, then he says deception and then all out lies. See, he didn't start off with all out lie, did he? He didn't, he didn't come to Eve, in the day you eat of it, you shall not surely die. He came out with an incredulous, covert truth, negative. He said, uh huh. Then when she was a full blown deception, now is full-blown lies because why discernment is gone and i can tell her whatever that's why now he said now i got her now let's go to the next level so what do you tell her next <laughs> now he told her this stuff is just totally make no sense it's totally impossible he said hey verse five for doth for god doth know that the day you eat of thereof your eyes shall be open <laughs> i got her now and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And we already know that's a bold-faced lie. Because the way she's, she, she's in full-blown deception, she's, she's believing that she can actually be like God. Now, she's made in the image of God. She's not God, but made in the image of God. She, so you already had the, she, she already had the, the man, the able, she was able to glorify God already. She was already had what Satan is claiming that he can give. She's in full-blown deception. And Eve mind, she is interpreting Satan's words with the help of demonic spirits to say in first person, God is holding something back from me. Remember, Satan, he likes to speak in first person. It's God is holding something back from me. Like the snake said, I can be like God. How can a snake speak with such wisdom? I must have what he has. Lesson number nine, when Satan tempts, he or his demons will sometimes speak to you in first person. You know what that is? He used words I and me and, and uh, my. For example, a person, Satan is tempting them to be all, to be all uh, tempted with depression and sadness and Hopeless and gloom. For example, he'll come to you and to discourage you. He'll say, I'm hopeless. Nobody cares about me. Now, that's not your original thought. That was Satan telling you that, but speaking in first person. He does that many times. And many times we think that's our original thought, but it's actually a demonic spirit. 
And so Satan, because because she now is in full blown deception, she's actually now susceptible to all these thoughts she never ever had before. But thinking it is her own. And Satan, that's his main one of his main weapons he uses a day. Even also observed, also observed this. The snake was touching, eating this, eating from wasn't the snake probably all rubbing against the, the fruit of the tree, eating it. And she probably, as she's looking at this snake, in her mind, a wise snake. So if nothing is happening to him, it must be all right. I don't see he ain't dead. And, I, and I'm touching it. God must not be telling the truth. Here, touch. Oh, it's all right. So what's the lesson number 10 here? We're almost, we're almost at the end now. 12 lessons. So we're at the end. Almost at the end. Lesson number 10. Hebrews six eighteen says it's impossible for God to what? Lie. John 8, 44 reveals that Satan is the author of lies. He bows not in the truth. So whenever somebody disregards God's truth, but tempts you to try to follow their way, and they make it appear that, hey, there's nothing wrong happening to me. There's no consequences what's happening to me. Come on. I, I, yeah, I know you go to church on Saturday. I know you go to church on Sabbath. But hey, hey I, I go, I have my cookouts, everything. We'll be having a good time. But ain't nothing happening to us. Come on now. Hey, so how can it be true if, hey, look, look at my house. Look at my car. I, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. You know, I'm a salesperson. My, my biggest sales on Saturday. Everything's okay. Don't forget this. And Satan does this all the time. He, <laughs> he does it so much. So whenever someone disregards God's truth, as if God is lying, but make it appear that they must be right in his wrong because he does not appear to be reaping the consequences of disobedience. He tempts you that nothing will happen to you either, insinuating that you are stupid not to do what he does. You know family does that. You know they do that. They try to make you say, Man, ain't nothing wrong with me. What's something wrong with you? You just ain't having no fun. We just having a good time. See, I said, I love God. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. The Bible makes it very clear. Get out. See, when people are like that and trying to get you to sin and try to do what they're doing because ain't nothing happening to them, it's something going to happen to them. <laughs> but the thing is, the sad thing is, because you know more, you know more truth than they, something going to happen to you sooner. Full-blown deception is taking place. Get out. What did Eve do next in verse 6? Let's look at it ends and we wrap this up. Genesis 3, 6. And when the woman saw that a tree was good for food, it was what? Good for food and was pleasant to the eyes. And the tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and did eat. And what does Satan do? He tantalizes us. He wants to bypass our thought process and go directly to our senses. See, when, see our thought process our frontal lobe, our decision-making process should control all of this, to control these things. But Satan, he presents things in a way to bypass your frontal lobe and actually make things tantalizing. That's the reason why he used the most beautiful snake in the garden. He put out that advertisement. He makes his presentations awaken the senses, the sight, your hearing, your touch, your smell, your taste. And he says in a very arithmetic, seductive way, hey, come on, eat. 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 Come on. Lesson number 11. Another technique that Satan used to tempt us is that he will always appear. He will what? always appeal he does never appeal to your your thinking he never appeals to your your logic he always appears to your what sight your hearing your touching your spelling your taste he wants to bypass your decision making process in front of the lobe and entice your senses that's what he wants to do so when you get hungry and i'm hungry i'm hungry he wants you to reach out and get the snickers but the thing is what should actually have control of it my thought, I'm hungry, but it's going to determine when I eat, how I eat, and what I eat, right? But it's not always I'm hungry. You're like, hmm, what, what is that? Oh, okay, an apple. What was that? Oh, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't drink soda. It's, but Satan just wants you to just, because it just tastes good. 
He does not want your frontal lobe process to happen. He wants you to live for the moment just to satisfy your hunger. And so Eve began to hunger. She fell at a point of appetite. She began to imagine Snickers really satisfies you. All this comes from Satan. He's saying that if you take the Snicker bar, you're going to be satisfied. I'm loving it. The best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. It's the real thing. Wow. I can, you, mean, I can, I, I, you mean if I eat this, I, I'll, I have that? Oh, yes. And that's why she fell for the first advertisement. And Satan's advertisement have not changed. They're still the same. They still put stuff in pretty packages that make people eat things that's going to kill them. And Satan and Eve yielded to Satan's temptation at the point of appetite. She saw the tree was what? Good for food. Pleasant to the eyes. It's tantalizing. He said, I think I'll, I'll, I'll try this. I believe what he's saying. And she eats. I'm going to end out on this here. What does Eve do next in the second half of verse 6? Verse 6 says, and she gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. What do we see here? Eve becomes, remember, Satan was chained at the tree, but now he has an agent. And that agent is one of the closest persons to Adam. His pride, his, his jewel, the apple of his eye, the love of his life now becomes the tempter. See, Eve was tempted by the snake. Now she is tempting Adam. She becomes an agent of Satan. And it's, imagine, it's interesting because here we see with a basket full of fruits from the forbidden tree, you can imagine now she's actually gotten the tree and she's, nothing happened to her. She plucks them off the tree. She's like, mm, this is actually pretty good. And now Adam sees Eve walking up to her in all her beauty and innocence. He, he probably said, Eve, uh, where have you been? I, I missed you. We normally always together. Eve, the apple of his eye, the bone of his bone, the flesh of his flesh, tells him his adventure. He said, Adam, let me just tell you what, why I was out. You know, I'm going to tell you what some things has happened. So she relays him her experience at the forbidden tree and, and beautiful wise snake and how this beautiful wise snake talked to her. You imagine as Eve is telling all about her adventure. Adam's heart begins to race. Why is it racing? Because he's worrying now. He's like, wait a minute. He tells himself, please, please, please don't tell me. Please, don't. no, please, no, no, she didn't. Uh, no, she didn't. No, she didn't. Don't tell me she ate from the tree. No, please don't tell me she, no, please don't tell me she ate from the tree. I hope she didn't. Well, this has got to be a joke, right? Now, while these worried thoughts are running through his mind, Eve says, he says what he was worrying about. Adam and I ate. Oh, man. You gotta be joking. I ate from the tree, and honey, you know the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Look at me. I did not die. So, what is he telling you? Hey, God is lying. I ain't dead. Look at me. Look, 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 look. You can imagine Adam for the first time feels great frustration. He never felt this before. He puts his hand on his head in disbelief. You can imagine with many thoughts racing through his head. Man, why did I leave her? Why did I let her go by? Why? I shouldn't even let her. I should have kept, kept my eye on her. Why did, I should have kept my eye on her. Why did I let her leave my side? Oh, man. He looks at his wife with the food in the hand. He, he got all types of thoughts going through his mind. He looks at the love of his life while she offers him the fruit from the forbidden tree. She said, Adam, why don't you take a bite? He knows, he's like, man, she's been deceived. He knows that Eve clearly broke the commandment of God. He knows that she's in full-blown rebellion. She knows that he, she's rejected truth. With the influence of the spirit of Satan, 
that now surrounds Eve, Adam began to contemplate God's truth. Listen to her, listen to her, listen to her. He began to question God's truth and doubt began to overcome his mind. And what happens when you start to doubt? Deception can come in. He, he began to, it began to, oh, he knew that if he refused Eve's offer that she would die. He knew that God said what he said and she will cease to exist. He knew it, but he said, this is Eve. She's beautiful. I can't imagine. In his mind, he began to imagine his life without her. He began to think, okay, what if she's not here? Let me see how his heart, he had, a, he had a lump in his throat. and His heart began to beat faster. And he said, oh, this is the love of my life. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. She's so beautiful. I can't imagine life without her. Oh. And what happens? He doubt that God can replace Eve. He said he can never make somebody like her. He can never make someone like her. He doubted that that he would ever get over missing Eve. He, the pain was already, is already there. He can already imagine the feeling. He's like, there's no way I can get over this pain. It's hurt. So only thinking about himself, he begins to sympathize with Eve. Poor baby. Adam, the love of his life. Eve, rude over his love for truth. Remember, the Bible makes it very clear in these last days we're going to have what? The love for the truth. And Adam disregarded the love for the truth and placed his love on Eve. He disregarded his love for God. Doubt crept in his mind. Adam chose to love Eve more than his creator, God. And when Adam allowed doubt to creep in, he himself was open to believe Satan's lies. He couldn't believe it. He willfully and intentionally ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil because he himself began to question the character of God. And he ate. And a lot of the commentary I got it from, I got it from uh, Patriot and Pro Patriarchs and Prophets. The title was called The Temptation and the Fall. But you'll find this here in uh, page 56, paragraph 2. Continuing on about Adam. He resolved to share her fate. If she must die, he would die with her. After all, he reasoned, might not the words of the wise serpent be true? Eve was before him as beautiful and apparently as innocent as before this act of disobedience. She expressed greater love for him than before. No sign of death appeared in her, and he decided to brave the consequences. So he seized the fruit and quickly ate. After his transgression, Adam at the first, first imagined, he said, maybe, maybe that snake was right. Maybe I'm about to hit this, 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 this new place of, of euphoria. But it didn't happen. But soon the thought of sin filled, filled him with terror. The air, which had hitherto been a mild and uniform temperature, seemed to chill the gu guilty pair. The love and peace, which had been theirs, was gone. And in its place, they felt a sense of sin, a dread of the future, a nakedness of soul. The robe of light, which had shrouded them, now disappeared. And to supply its place, they endeavored to fashion themselves a covering, for they could not, while unclothed, meet the eye of God and holy angels. Now they began to see the true character of sin. Adam and Eve lost what they already had. They already had freedom. They already had wisdom. They already had peace. They already had truth. They were not God, but they were made in the image of God to reflect the glory of God. But Satan wanted to, wanted to make it appear that they didn't have these things. And he wanted to make it appear they can yearn for something that's, they can yearn for these things that they already have. 
Last lesson. When tempting you, Satan and his demons always present you offers to make it appear that you will gain more by yielding to his temptation. And that's what we're looking at next time. Because he did the same way to see, he did the incredulous questions, the same thing exactly to, to Jesus himself. He made it appear that things would be better if you just fall down and worship me. You can have all this. He would make it appear that you are in bondage when you are actually free in Jesus. He would make it appear that obedience is legalism when, when you're just expressing your love to Jesus. He would make it appear that you are stupid when you're already wise in Jesus. He would make it appear that you are depressed when you're already happy in Jesus. If you yield to Satan's temptation, you will find out like Adam and Eve, you will lose what you already had. Do you want to lose what you already got? Freedom in Jesus? The only way to overcome temptations of God's word is God's truth. That's the reason why we need to know God's truth for ourselves in these last days. Because if I don't know this truth, the explicit, do you understand again why every word of God is important? Because did you see how Eve omitted, added to, and where is she found? Found deceived. And that's the reason why God says every word is true. Didn't he say that? Every word is true. That's why God said in his revelation, don't take it away. Don't add to it. Because if you take away or add to it, then what's going to be added to you are the plagues that come from this book. So the only way we can make it, we must have faith in the explicit, revealed truth of God's word in these last days to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, there is no light. And if she understood that, she would have been, she would, she would have, she'd have ran away. There's no light. Let me get out of here. Same thing. Next time we're going to study part two of this because it's actually, it continues to go, it's actually a deep study. The Science of Temptation part two. You continue. So do you now know exactly what Satan does? Especially those incredulous questions. Those covert negatives. Those questions, because Satan always asks questions. And one thing is you notice, you know, today a lot of people go to the Internet to try to find out truth. And most of those people have doubt. And what you know, I find when we do Bible studies, they first, one of the first things they do is go to the Internet. And next thing I know, they doubt. Why? Because they're listening to incredulous questions on the Internet. Stupidity. And they're, and they're just sucked into it. Oh, they must be a cult because they keep the Sabbath. That makes no sense at all. Let us pray. Dearly Father, Lord, again, we reveal your truth. We see the science of temptation that Satan uses in these last days. And none of us, Lord, want to be caught up in it. Lord, you reveal these truths to us for a reason. You're letting us know, Lord, Satan's game plan. So we will not be caught in deception. Lord, may we never, ever doubt your word. Satan would do all he can to test us on this point, this very point, to get us a doubt. Lord, it doesn't matter. Though the heavens fall, Lord, may every single one of us today make a commitment to follow truth and truth only. No matter what other people are doing, no matter what other people are saying, may we stay faithful to the truth. No matter what a conference is saying, no matter what a church is saying, doesn't matter what a pastor is saying, may we stay faithful to the truth in these last days. We thank you. We praise your holy and precious name. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name.